This is the sixth video for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. In the first video, we learned how to build a physical device that can perform calculations. In this video, we'll learn why the techniques used to build that device don't scale well. This is the circuit we built during video one. It determines whether a given number between zero and seven is prime. We used a very specific process to design it. First, we prepared a truth table specifying exactly when the output should be 1 and when it should be 0. Then, we created a set of wires connected to the inputs. These wires tell us when the wire is a 1. We also added a set of NOT gates below each wire to tell us when the input is 0. The next step was to add a set of AND gates. Each AND gate looks for one of the inputs that should produce a 1 as output. And then finally, these AND gates are connected to a single OR gate, which returns a 1 if any of the AND gates produces a 1. Now, you can use this technique to build any circuit for which the output depends only on a fixed size input. That's called a combinatorial circuit, but we'll get back to that later. I call this technique the big hammer method because in some sense you're just taking a big powerful tool like a hammer and smashing the problem. It's not a very elegant solution, but it works. Now let me emphasize that the term big hammer is one I came up with on my own. You're not going to find it in a textbook and I wouldn't just go rattling it off in a job interview without explaining where it comes from first because they're not likely to have heard of it. Now the problem with this inelegant technique is that it doesn't scale well. The first problem is it's inefficient. So let me give you an extreme example. So let's say we want a circuit to tell us whether a 4-bit number is even or odd. Using this crude big hammer method would give us a circuit that looks something like this. Now notice that this circuit uses 13 gates. But think about it for a minute. How can you tell at a glance if a binary number is even? Well, here's a hint. How can you tell if a decimal number is a multiple of 10? Well, in decimal, multiples of 10 end with 0. So for an analogous reason, multiples of 2 in binary also end with a 0. So if you want to tell if a binary number is even, just look at its least significant bit. This bit, or the least significant wire, will have a zero on it if and only if the number is even. That means we could also implement the circuit this way, using one gate instead of 13. Now like I said, this is an extreme case, but it does show that circuits designed crudely using that big hammer technique often end up much larger than necessary. Of course, in most instances, the inefficiencies of using the big hammer method are a little more subtle. Now the problem with using the crude method is actually a little bigger than simple inefficiency. Let's think about how the size of the circuit grows as the number of inputs grow. So let's look back at the original version of that is even circuit. And it has four input pins, which means we can give it numbers between 0 and 15. If we want to be able to give it larger numbers, we need more input pins. So if we add a fifth input pin, we can now give it numbers between 0 and 31. But the truth table now has twice as many rows, and the circuit now has twice as many AND gates. Now this pattern of doubling in size when the input grows by just one bit is a classic example of what we call exponential growth. Notice how much faster the graph of 2 to the x grows than the graph of x squared. x only has to be as large as 18 before the purple line is off the top of the chart, whereas you can barely see the green x squared graph just above the bottom of the graph. And x squared is not a slow growing function. So in theory, Although these increasingly large circuits generated with the naive big hammer technique will technically work, it's not practical to build them. To see why, let's look at another extreme case for fun. Let's see what happens if we try to use this technique to build a 64-bit adder. That is, a circuit that can take in two 64-bit numbers and add them together. Most desktops or laptops you buy today would have a 64-bit adder at the core of the CPU. So this isn't an unusual circuit by any means. So if we're going to use the big hammer technique, the first step would be to construct a truth table which means explicitly listing the desired output for each possible input. Now this adder takes 128 bits as input, right, the two 64-bit numbers, and any combination of zeros and ones on those 128 input pins represents a valid input, so the truth table would have 2 to the 128 rows. To understand just how big of a number that is, let's think about how long it would take a computer to generate that truth table. So how many rows do you think a typical desktop could generate per second? 
for the back of the envelope, let's see. Most computers run between 1 and 4 gigahertz. So it's reasonable to say we could generate 4 billion rows per second as a conservative estimate. No, actually, we could probably pick a bigger number than that because most desktops and laptops you buy today have more than one core. And as you'll learn in 451, those cores have tricks in them that might let them be able to produce two or more rows per clock tick. So let's just be completely absurd. Let's pick a number far bigger than any computer today could generate and say we could generate a trillion rows per second. So at that rate, which we can't even achieve, it would still take 10 to the 19 years to complete this truth table. And that's much, much longer than the age of the universe. So clearly we already can't use the big hammer technique on this particular circuit. We'd be waiting for the heat death of the universe for that first step to even finish. But if we gloss over that little fact and pretend that time isn't the main issue, let's think about how big the resulting circuit would be. So remember, with the first video, we had one AND gate for each row of the truth table that had a one in it. Now for the adder, there's more than one output pin. So what we'll have is an AND gate for any row in the truth table for which there's a one on any one of the output pins, which means the only input rows that we don't have an AND gate for are the ones that produce all zeros, and there aren't many of those. So it's reasonable to estimate that there are 2 to the 128th AND gates. Now if we again make a ridiculously conservative estimate and assume that we can build each of these 2 to the 128 AND gates out of a single atom of silicon, which of course we would need more than that in real life, but if we only had a single atom of silicon per AND gate, this circuit would weigh 6.7 trillion kilograms. And that's not counting the OR gate or the wires or any of that other stuff. And so to put that in perspective, that's heavier than if you weighed all of the water in Torch Lake. Now the bottom line is that this big hammer technique has practical limits, and because of exponential growth, even moderately sized reasonable circuits exceed those limits. So in the next video, we'll begin discussing techniques of how you would actually implement a reasonable sized circuit without having it be heavier than Torch Lake. But before we do that, I do want to remind you of a situation where this big hammer technique is actually helpful. It so happens that it costs thousands of dollars to configure the machine that you use to make computer chips. Well, to be more precise, it costs thousands of dollars to set up small computer chips. If you're trying to set up a factory to make like a CPU, that could cost upwards of a million dollars. But once the machine is set up, the actual incremental cost of making a chip is small. It only costs a few cents for each chip you produce at that point, and it might cost a few dollars for each CPU you produce at that point. So for as big as that setup cost is, it becomes minor when you can amortize that cost or spread that cost out over millions of chips. But the downside is that this isn't effective when you only need a few chips, right? Imagine that you're building a robot, so you need a specialized chip for just this one robot in this one factory. It doesn't make sense to spend thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to configure a chip making machine just to make a few dozen chips. So what do you do? You use something called a programmable logic array which is a chip laid out like the big hammer technique, right? It's a chip that's laid out like this with wires and NOT gates connected to the inputs and a series of AND gates and then a series of OR gates for the output. And so what you'll do is you'll set up your chip making machine with this pattern of wires and gates in it, but notice that none of the wires are connected but you can still pay that big cost to set it up and you can produce your chips like this. They don't actually do anything, but you set them up in a special way that when somebody buys the chip, they can come in to their, their own production facility and then make the connections they need. They're, they're doing the equivalent of something like this where they'll connect the input wires to the AND gates as needed for the particular circuit they're building. And likewise, they'll have to connect the AND gates and the OR gates. But the bottom line is they can take a mass produced chip where the cost of the setup is amortized over millions of chips. And then they can do the last customization step in their own factory to get the chip they need without paying tens of thousands of dollars. If you didn't quite follow what I was doing here by connecting the wires, you can go back and watch the last few minutes of the first video. It explains this idea in much more detail.
The important thing to understand is that the PLA gives you a means of having that economy of scale when you only need a very small number of a specific chip. Provided, of course, that the chip you need has few enough inputs that you're not too far along on that exponential growth curve. I will briefly mention that PLAs are not the only way that you can have customizable hardware where you can buy a piece of mass-produced hardware and then configure it for your own needs. A more recent development is a tool called a field programmable gate array. I'm not going to say more about that here because it's time to wrap up the video. And this is getting more into the electrical engineering than the computer science, but we can certainly talk about it in class if there are any questions. All right, so to summarize, the big hammer technique is a good way to begin thinking about hardware and understanding this idea of building a physical device that can do computation. And it also is useful in a few key situations. But in most situations, we need to use different, more efficient design techniques that produce smaller circuits. And we'll begin talking about those techniques in the next video.